get the record button going as well is always helpful. So today we're joined with uh, Debbie Roberts, the co-founder of Pure Bookkeeping. How are you today, Debbie? I'm very well, Katrina. How are you going? Yes, very well, very well. Very excited for this topic. We love everything about business. Yes. And also joined with Robin Flynn um, from Somerville Bookkeeping. Is that the right name, Amy? Yeah. Yep. Thank you for joining us today. And, and of course, we've asked Robin to join us because she has, has created a business model which is very definite in her planning around it and um, is a lifestyle business. So um, it's wonderful to hear her, her um, opinions on, on how she's created that and, and built that out as well. So, all right, so let's get started. So I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, we wanted to talk about was um, in creating out your business model is that you really do want to have your um, end in mind. So what it is that you are trying to build um, and why you are trying to build that and, you know, at what, at what um, when you want to build that out or when you want to, you know, retire from it. So really thinking about, you know, the planning in place for, you know, what this business is that you are building. Um, and I know, Deb, you've got some comments around, um, you know, the vision, the, you know, why, why we're building this business and what is this business that we are building. Mm. Yeah. And look, I, I chose a business model that um, to have staff and I wanted to go to what we call black belt. And I, Katrina, I think we're going to be having a look or talking about the, the bookkeeping business blueprint, which is basically a business um, a business plan on a page. Anyway, the, the top rung of that is black belt. It's using a martial arts metaphor, the white belt to black belt and putting on $100,000 every year, which if you're working full-time in the business and you've got no other restrictions or complications or whatever and this is what you want to do it is possible to put on a hundred thousand dollars if you're going hard with your marketing and you've you've got your recruitment happening and there's things ticking over all the time you can do that and that is a business model that I chose because getting back to what Katrina said initially my goal was to replace my husband's income now I initially had that goal I didn't say I'm going to put 500,000, oh, sorry, 100,000 every year for five years. I made it a 10 year goal because I did have other commitments. I had school aged children and, and really I didn't know what, when I started, of course, I, I didn't have uh, any systems. I had to write them as I was going. But my number one goal was to replace my husband's income in 10 years. And in order to do that, I knew I had to grow beyond myself. So because of that decision, because of that vision, I then worked back and said, well, I can't do that if I'm just working on my own because that's one income. I need to generate two people's income. So um, I thought, well, that's, that's what I have to do. Now, how do I get there then? And so I went along and, and grew my business to 12 staff and then sold it in 2014. Um, I know we've got... Uh, an, with, with our licensees, we've got lots of licensees, Robin, including yourself, and we can hear a bit about your story. They uh, start off, they come because they want a business, they want to do what Debbie did, I guess. So put the systems in place, put staff in place, and then grow to a black belt business. But it doesn't actually, that model doesn't suit everyone because not everyone has the same sort of goal that I had, and they have other things that other priorities, other goals, other direction that they want to go in. And so it, it's, a, it's a really, really important thing for you to grow a business that you love, a model that you love, that you don't feel you're, you know, doing what Debbie did or doing what Katrina did. She grew a, a black belt business as well and sold that. Um, but it doesn't mean uh, and we don't stand for that as well. We, we, we stand for you creating a business model that you love. And Robin, you, you can tell us a bit about your story uh, when you first came to Pure Bookkeeping as well. Yeah, um, look, when I first came to Pure Bookkeeping, I was um, yeah, probably looking to grow my business. 
probably more looking to make money, like <laughs> make mm -hmm. some good money. You know, I'd been sort of coasting along a little bit and I decided that I wanted to, yeah, just pick it up a bit and make some serious money. So, um, so that's what I decided to do. But then along the way, I did sort of come to realise and I guess just um, nut out what exactly I wanted, not just in my business, but in life. And I sort of meshed those together so that um, I wasn't working um, to do something and I wasn't, I wasn't missing out on anything. I could have um, the business that I wanted and get, because um, I enjoy it, and I think a lot of bookkeepers do, um, get the enjoyment from um, doing the bookkeeping and also running a business, but making it fit in with my life so that I don't miss out on anything. And um, it actually supports my lifestyle now. <laughs> so mm. the money that I um, that I need to make to be able to do the things that I want to do. So um, yeah, it is it is for me. Um, oh well, for everybody about working out what you want. And I think. Um, I've mentioned this before about sort of doing like an anti-life plan. So working out um, what what you would like. So for Debbie, you wouldn't you would not have wanted to be the only person working in your business. Um, and maybe um, like Katrina, you wouldn't have wanted to be sitting there working from home. So like you would have you could have put that down as this is what I don't want. <laughs> and then working out, well, okay, well, so what do I need to to get to that point that I do want and um yeah and I've certainly done that before sort of reflected on what would be my worst case scenario in the end if I was doing what you know would I be unhappy and and then that really helps you define what would make you happy and and making your business fit into that yeah, mm. yeah. that's a really great uh, exercise to do it's not not one that I actually did did you do something similar Deb what no, you I didn't do don't it. I've never heard of people. Um, certainly didn't. Our mentors will have to slap our mentors because it's a, it's actually a good um, exercise to do because you think about all the things that you do want, but sometimes other things do come in to the equation, and you've you accepting them because well you are working towards what you do want, but if these things that are sneaking in are actually things that you definitely don't want it just makes you identify the other end as well yeah. so it could be you definitely don't want to be working weekends or you know past eight o'clock at night mm. or whatever it is they sneak in because you are building a business you're trying to get a you know a half a million dollar business so those type of things sneak in to to because you're fo so focused on one aspect is what you do want but if you were also focused on what you don't want I don't want to weekend, work weekends. Well, then you've got to find another way of getting to that half a million without working weekends. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and one of the things that I just thought came into my mind then that what I didn't want was the business to be dependent on me. Mm. So that was, that was a big driver as well. So if the business, if that's what I don't want, and this was probably, even though I didn't articulate that at the time, that was the intent that the business was not dependent on me. Then I would say, what I said to myself was, okay, how do I do that then? If I want to grow a black belt business that isn't dependent on me, I've got to put the systems in place. It's got to be, it's Michael E. Gerber, you know, the original E-Myth Revisited. It's going back to, the, that's the very first business book I read. And he says, system, 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 systems. Mm. You know, it's got to be around that. So that's what started my journey of, okay, so what I don't want is the business to be dependent on me. So when I had staff asking me things all the time and me having to check their work or sign off on an email or something like that, I go, what system do I need to put in place because this is doing my head in? And it's still dependent on me. It's, mm -hmm. And it's, in, it's an interesting process because when you start to step back, when you do put that first person on and you step one, just one little step back from that, you see where the holes are in your systems as well. Mm -hmm. So you see what things fall through the cracks. And then you go up, you shore it up again. You come back in and you go, oh, hang on, that, 
that fell through, you didn't do this or whatever it is, okay, what system do I need to put in place to make sure that doesn't happen again? And then you step back again. This is a, it's actually a really useful tip, I guess, when people who are nervous about growing and putting on staff, that's really essentially how you do it. You, you stay close to the person that you're training and you fill, you come back up and you fill the gaps and you write another step in your system that mm. is where, wherever the gap happened, wherever it fell through the gaps. Mm. Yeah, really important. And one of the things that I, I knew for myself was that I wanted to build an independent business that wasn't dependent on me. But what I, I, I but what I didn't have is the what I don't want, which is to be all um, all in, in embracing or you know taking over your life. Mm-hmm. Um, your business takes over your life because you are always trying to build this independent business. So what do I need to build now? What do I need to do now? So and, and I felt as if you know that did take over your life and your lifestyle because you're constantly growing and thinking and and you know, what, what do I need to put into place? Whereas, you know, if I, if I did actually think I don't want this to be all, you know, or what's the word, all empowering, all embracing, yeah. Yeah. That, that it, you know, you, you faster realise that there's got to be a balance. So, you know, as we know as bookkeepers, we just take on all of this work and we take on all of these issues of our of our business, of our clients, of our staff, where if you go, okay, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want that to be all empowering or overpowering, what do I need to put into place to balance that out? I still want to build my business, but I don't want everything to be on my, in, you know, in my emotional, you know, in your brain and, you know, overpowering you. Mm. So it's, yeah, putting, putting that, that's recognising that, I suppose, you know, the, the, the differences between what you want and what you don't want um, and making sure that you put things into place, boundaries into place, which is, it's actually a webinar I've just spoken to Amanda from ICB. We're having a webinar for our licensees next month around putting strategies in place um, for, uh, for yourself and expectations and, and things like around boundaries. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's a, it's a it's a you know a, a trick that you do need to implement for the safety of your your own health and your own business as well. Mm. Yeah. And and if you don't put those boundaries in place, you do end up with a business that is not what you were planning. Mm. You end up, yeah, mm. or you a life. Up. You might you might have the business that you want, but you don't have the life that you want. Yeah, it's even worse. Yeah, I think one of the things that. Um, that I like to use and um, I know that um, you both had staff um, but and you possibly did this as well is is automation taking advantage of automation Um, there's that I I can't think of exactly what the process is but it's like you know you either delete it you delegate it Mm -hmm. you yeah Um, yeah but then there's that extra one that you can put in there which is automate like if there's things that keep coming up that, um, you know, that you need to delegate or that they're taking up your time, automate it. Mm. Use automation as, as a tool, um, not necessarily um, instead of stuff, but it is a step that you can put in there that might hold off, you know, um, needing to do that. Or if you're like me, um, just working by yourself, I use those things um, so that I can get more work done without having to have the staff. Mm. Yeah. And I think uh, uh, these days automation is part of business. You'd be silly not to take advantage of the fabulous automations that are available now. And mm. I know, Robin, when you were looking, when you first joined Pure Bookkeeping and you just said earlier that you wanted to grow a business and have staff and things like that, but then realised that it didn't really fit with your well your family's your, as you said your personal your husband um and the leave that he gets and being able to travel and when you started that was an important process um in because you started off thinking well I'm going to go and do it you know it might not have been a black belt business but you were going to grow and grow but then you realize because 
when you if you make that decision to grow and have staff there's a point where it's not easier it's mm. actually harder um, because you are managing staff and putting on new clients and then you're recruiting there's a lot of stuff going on which does take up your time and Katrina you mentioned about the work-life balance and things like that and I'm I'd be the first one to say there were many years probably that I didn't have a work-life balance um mm because I was writing all the systems and, you know, because I didn't have that all systematized and automated and things like that. So it was a lot of hard work. And I was actually speaking to another licensee uh, this week and she was saying, how did you do that? Because she's after that work-life balance. She doesn't want to work, or you know, every weekend. I didn't work every weekend, but I worked a lot of weekends uh, or at least part of some of the weekends. And I was definitely working nights. And I was up early in the morning and doing stuff with family in between. So there was a, although it wasn't, I'd say it wasn't a work-life balance. It was still, I made time for the really important things, but it did put pressure on myself to make mm. everything work. And you, and I, and she said, how did you do it? And I said, look, I, I, I didn't have always have the work-life balance. It was not always perfect. Uh, but I said, the reason I was doing what I was doing is what kept me going. And I also put a date on that. So I think it's really important that whatever kind of model you're growing, that there may be sacrifices that will be necessary. But if you know why you're making those sacrifices and you have an end date of when, okay, I'm prepared to work every second weekend for the next 12 months or something like that. Whatever you think is a fair, it's like a boundary. I'm only going to work on a Saturday for the next 12 months or whatever the thing is that you're okay with. But put be, you say, right, for 12 months, I'm going to do this because when you put an end date on it, you can see, you can see where the end is happening. You can see the light at the end of the tunnel and there is a sacrifice and there's trade-offs, but it, there is an end date to that as well. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It'd be nice to hear from um, those in the audience today if they'd like to come off mute and talk about what their business model is and the challenges that they're experiencing and, and get some get some feedback from uh, the people that are on the call today. So April of Jacqueline, um, would you like to come off mute? There's a few more people and I can't see all their screens. Stephen, hi Stephen and Maurice, welcome. Yeah, April, you're off mute. Would you like to share your story? Yeah, so um, largely it's just me in the business. I've got a um, part-timer and say part-time contractor. And I'm struggling with um, what to do with myself each day. So I started this business before I left my full-time job. So I've been going a couple of years, let's say two years. Um, and I'm still putting in a hell of a lot of time, very little money coming in, not enough systems in place, and my head is spinning. My feet don't touch the ground back to back on doing things like this learning things so yeah I've learned a lot but I am struggling with what to do with myself each part of the day to get this to a point where I'm not working in it all day every day mm. so I'm planning out um your your months, your days, your year. And, and Robin, did you have an exercise that you were going to talk about, about the, the daily, the ideal uh, day, the, the work? Uh, the work you have, yeah, I do have a perfect week. That so. might be helpful for April right at the moment and then, you know, we'll continue on that conversation as well. Yeah. Um, did you want me to explain yeah. what I'm doing? Yeah. yeah. Um, so basically I just have, um, and I'm not sure if you can do it live. It sounds like you're really, really overwhelmed at the moment, but um, what I do is set up a perfect week. So if, you know, if I ideally had everything worked perfectly for my week, how would it look? And so I put into that even, um, you know, time that I have lunch with my mum, 
um, any anything that I want to get done that's personal, but also um, I know that I'm really productive first thing in the morning and it goes downhill as I go into the afternoon. So I make sure that I, um, I set that time up in the mornings, you know, in blocks for really productive time. Um, and that's just an overlay. I just have a separate calendar in Google Calendar and I think you can probably do it in Outlook as well. I just created a different calendar called My Perfect Week or Perfect Week. Um, and I put in all of those time blocks and then at the start, you know, either on Sunday night normally or a Monday morning, um, I have a look at what I've got to do for the week and I drag it around into um, so that it fits into that perfect week so that what I'm doing is setting myself up for the best results. You know, I'm working when I'm really productive. Um, Friday afternoon, maybe doing, you know, <laughs> more of a scanning or something like that where I don't have to think too much, put a movie on and, you know, do some scanning, um, that sort of thing. And I'm also making sure that I'm spending that time that I need for myself to fill myself up. So, you know, time with friends, time with family, that sort of thing. And it does change a little bit each week, of course, because you have different commitments, but I fit it in around what I need to do to, you know, operate at my best. So um, it could be something that you could look at in the future once you've sort of got through this really, um, yeah, overwhelming and stressful time. I actually yeah. have that. I, I've heard you speak about that before, and I have, I have the uh, quite a few, well a few Google calendars, and I can tick on or off which ones, how much I want to look at to overlap. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm just struggling with um, what to do first. You know, yeah. like like that dragging around, like which things flick out, which stay in, and what's yeah. more important. I think uh, I I've, I've got a bit of a thought about that. Um, you mentioned, you know, you're spending a lot of time working on your business, really, essentially, it sounds like. Uh, a lot of learning, a lot of leadership thinking, all of that is really good. But um, one of the traps that can happen is you're wanting to get, I don't, don't mean you necessarily, April, uh, this is a, it happens often, um, that you're wanting to get everything perfect so then you've got all your systems in place and then you'll start to grow. I actually think there needs to come a point in time and I'm thinking it's sooner rather than later. You need to bring some income in. So it's about getting your, your systems will be okay. And they'll never be perfect because they will always be evolving and there will always be something new to learn. That's the nature of the industry. Um, and so be okay with, um, I've done enough of that. I've done enough of getting these in place. Marketing. I need, you know, what marketing am I doing? Because sometimes, particularly uh, with us bookkeepers who don't like marketing, um, we can become busy with other things that are very productive, uh, very interesting, lots of learning and useful, but they're not actually uh, giving, bring, bringing in any income. And I think... Um, they, they will, if you if you delay that for too long, you might become disheartened and say, look, I really, I love what I'm doing, but I've got to earn an income. Yeah. Um, so I'll go back and get a job and uh, as an employee. And you may even get pressure from your spouse mm -hmm. to, to do that as well. How long are you going to, you know, work on this? We need to both of us earn income, et cetera, et cetera. So... I think my advice would be sooner rather than later, put your marketing hat on and just smash out the marketing, networking meetings, meeting with accountants, face that fear um, uh, and get start getting clients in. And the other practical element of that is that once you get clients in, you can, you'll actually know what other systems you need or what is missing in your tech app that's going to make your life easier. Um, and if you think about it from my perspective, obviously there weren't any apps and tech things and stuff like that when I was growing my business. So it was really just get out there and market, do all those marketing things and then figure it out. You'll you just figure it out, but you've got to get the clients coming through the door. Does that, is, does that make sense? Is that helpful? Yeah, that's, that's good. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm probably on that track 
mm. because I've recently joined BNI and um, yeah, just doing everything I can there. Um, yeah. I've done my feature presentation. I've put my hand up to be an emergency presenter if someone else backs out for whatever reason. Um, so yeah, I'm getting I'm getting known. I'm getting the visibility, yeah. and who knows? It could all it could come good any minute. Mm. Do you have a plan for your future? Like, do you know what you want your business to look like? Do you know like how much money you want to earn and all that kind of thing? Okay. Well, for a, let's say for a five-year goal, I would like to get to the half million turnover. Whether I want to scale or have a lifestyle business or one to sell, I float from one to the other. But I think, yeah, under deep down, if I if I really think about it, um, I don't want to sell my business. I want it forever. Um, I don't plan to retire. I'd like to always have my business and be a part of it and be a part of the industry um, on my terms. You know what I mean? Like for as much as I do it, enjoy it, that's how much time I'll put into it. Mm. That sounds good. I like it. Yeah, yeah. that's clear. Um, one, one of the things that I'd, I'd talk about is that you've got your perfect week. You've, you've done your perfect week. So I would have a look at what your perfect week includes. Does it include too much work that isn't bringing clients in if you, you're looking for some money at the moment or so whether it needs more marketing and networking or more, you know, production or more, you know, passing over to your staff member? Um, and what else are you doing in that week? Maybe there are activities that you're too loaded in creating your systems at the moment when you, you, as Deb says, bring the money in and then the money will, you know, it can be passed over to staff and then the staff can also help you build your systems as well. Yeah. Um, and also, again, with if you're not earning enough money, is what, do you, what clients do you have in at the moment? What's your pricing like like are you pricing it correctly are you getting enough income you know if you valued it enough because a lot of times we get stuck with doing a lot of work at a low level where you could be doing less work at a higher level so you can pick and choose your clients so that you and then you when you're doing your marketing you're bringing in clients at a higher level so don't accept to keep those lower level clients for very long either replace them or bring them up to a higher level looking at your clients as well of how much drain they are taking on your energy so again there might be a lot of um a lot of time spent in just keeping those clients you know calm or you know um you know up to date or where it's or that you know they're they're not providing you the information on time. They're asking you questions every day. You know, the people that drain your energy where you don't think that you can charge out for, we get a lot of wasted hours. So reviewing your clients that you've got at the moment. So if you had, you know, a couple of D clients, bad clients that aren't pay good payers and don't appreciate and take up your time, if we were to scrap 20% of your D clients, spend some time in marketing and replace them with better clients well then we've got the same income for less work we've created a system for our marketing as well so yeah not only just going out and marketing and doing you visiting your bni and your accountants and stuff look at what you are currently doing what is already overwhelming you overtaking your your hours and your energy um yeah, so I'm not sure if you've got... I would say I only have D clients, like they're really oh. taking up too much energy. Oh, um, yeah. The thing is I can afford, however, I can afford to like just let that be as it is at the moment. But I'm stuck with, okay, I want to go for a higher level client that's going to be more profitable, say. Um, I am having difficulty identifying who that is. I don't have a niche industry. Um, I believe I have a niche type of person that I want to work with. It's a growth mindset. It's someone that wants to um, improve their own business. But I don't know how to put that across, uh, say, at BNI, for example, because what's going to work at BNI is if I, you know, describe that person like as an avatar to a T. It's not a woman or a man. It could, I mean, it's not just a woman. It's not just a man. It's it's either. It's a person, and it's a person with a business. It's not a hairdresser. It's not a childcare centre. It's that's where I'm stuck. Yeah. Mm. 
And I, I guess it. it's being a little bit more clear on that, who that business is. Like if it's a growth mindset, you know, you've got, you've got the scale, you've got startups that have a growth mindset might still might not have the money. Or if you've got, you know, a half a million dollar business, you know, a big size business with staff and they want to grow. So, you know, you want to be clear on, you know, what size of business that business is, how many staff they've got, where they want to go, how quickly they want to grow. Um, so there's a lot of things that, you know, thinking about who that ideal client is, but and the service that you want to provide them. So they might be in a growth mindset, but you don't want to just do best reviews. And, you know, going back to you've all you've only got D clients, I would, you know, you say that you're okay with the finance around that at the moment, but on the other end of the scale, you're saying, you, you know, you don't know where, what to do. Hmm. So it's almost like, you know, replacing one or two of those worst D that take up your most time that you get the most loss at. So analysing, you know, a few of those D clients right now, find out which ones are the worst of them and replace them immediately. And if you don't, if the finance is okay, get rid of them straight away and put the price up for everybody else. Mm. Let's see what sticks. Yeah. At the same time, keep marketing. Yeah. And the other you will find those clients that you enjoy working with. And I feel like that's where I am now. The clients that I've got, they're all just like, they're interesting, they're hardworking, um, they treat their staff well, like that's what you want. You want to be working that, you know, that makes you feel great about working with them. Um, I don't I don't know if I can identify them still like, say, when you get that initial phone call, I don't know that I would be able to identify them. But I do find that um, they kind of refer people and, I, you know, they're similar people. So, you, yeah, you will get to that point where you're, you're getting those great people that you enjoy working with. And it does make it lovely to, yeah, to do your work. Yeah. And I think that there is um, a, another thought while uh, Katrina was talking was, I think, and this is just a, what I think, it might, it might not be, you know, for you or whatever, but I think the growth mindset, you said you want a client or want clients who have a growth mindset. I actually think that that's a layer below the business, like it's part there's no industry that says growth mindset, you know. So that's, I think that's why you're struggling to target that because that's really, um, that can be across any industry. That's what, you, you know, you'd like to think that people go into business because they want to grow, because they want to make money and all of that. But we know that, that there are people that are in business that don't behave in, in a way that's going to be helpful to have them grow their business or they're not treating their staff properly and all of that sort of thing. But as Robin said, you, they're not easily identifiable. Um, where, and in, in terms of your marketing, and that's what I was thinking with B&I, it's almost an intangible thing to try to describe that and to get your members to understand what that means is difficult and so I think you need to you can have that as and they need to be have a growth mindset is the way I think of it but this is what I'm looking for first an ideal referral for me this week would be a hairdresser who has a growth mindset you know or something like that or whatever industry that you're in and you're looking and I, I did the same thing actually um uh, and we always say when you're creating a business model, you can't work for everyone. It's physically impossible to work for every business owner in Australia. And that's stating the bleeding obvious. Um, but so if you have got a finite amount of time, which we all have, and, um, and you can't work for everyone, then be selective. And yes, you, you might choose, you can, you can niche, Niching is a good idea because especially with the technology and the apps and things like that, you can become an expert in a particular industry. That's, that's fine. But you can also um, have lots of other clients in, in lots of different industries. 
But when you choose the clients, it's based on do you have a growth mindset kind of thing. But it's marketing is, I think, needs to be a level up above that because I think it will be a hard thing for your BNI members to grasp exactly what that means and how to, because I know I was in BNI, as you know, for four and a half years. And so the more specific you can be, the, the clearer they'll go, oh, so you're looking for a hairdresser. Oh, I'm going to speak to my hairdresser. I'm getting my hair cut this week. I'll speak to my hairdresser and find out if, if she's, who's doing the bookkeeping for her. Oh, great. Okay. I'll go away and do that. So you've got to be very specific. It's like giving a little pill and say, take that, that exact pill and take it at 8 a.m. in the morning. The more mm -hmm. specific you are with B&I and even with accountants who refer business to you and, and things like that, the more then then what you do is you'll get a whole bunch of referrals then you weed them through and choose the ones that you feel have a growth mindset or have the same core values as you so the growth mindset to me is at that same important level as core values do you treat your staff right do I feel comfortable what's my gut saying but you've got to get in the door first you've got to sit down with them in order to um, be able to ascertain whether they are a right fit for you. Yeah. And I would say, too, when you find that person, <laughs> when you first find that first client that's just, you know, spot on, exactly what you're after, great, ask for referrals. Ask them, you know, oh, do you know anybody? You know, I've, I've got some extra capacity. If you've got some anybody else that you know that needs a great bookkeeper, um, because you do find that those like-minded people all do hang out together. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So just say I um, decided to niche or make this avatar a privately owned childcare centre, and let's say there's 6,000 of those in Australia. Does that sound like a big enough market for me to be going for via BNI? B and I, like I, do, I, I don't mind you going for the childcare centres because there's a lot of work involved in childcare centres. I had a, a franchise, um, but in a B and I, you're asking for the locals to have children and go to locals. Do they have enough of a network? I mean, you, you could because you do a um, a thirty second spiel every week, so you could mention it one week. You know, that I've, you know, I've got, you don't have to say I'd stand up and I'm a bookkeeper, Bass agent, and I do Bass and compliance and get your stuff all, you know, organised. You can say, to, you know, this week I'm, you know, I've uh, highlighting childcare centres. I've got a couple on my, on my list and, you know, this, I do full service right through to the payroll. I know these systems. Do you have uh, contacts with um, you know, do your children go to childcare? Do you have cousins that go to childcare? So, you know, get them to think about their network. Um, and it's not just in this uh, location that I need it. I can do it online. And especially when you talk about specialising in software. Um, because then, and, it's, and, and then what do you want from it? You just want an introduction or you just want them to, you know, you're not going to get the BNI participant to go to a childcare centre and who's your bookkeeper. <laughs> you might say, you know, go to a childcare centre and, and ask you if I could introduce you to um, one of my, um, you know, BNI partners or some wording around, you know, one of, uh, um, you know, my colleagues or whatever that might be able to have a, a chat to you about, you know, making you more efficient or whatever, you know, something that the BNI participant can talk to the childcare centre owner about, um which is just, you know, giving a health check or, you know, just having an email introduction, whatever, something like that. Another thought that I just had then was, um, which I think is, could work, um, especially in a BNI environment, you could possibly, it's like coming in the back door in a way, ask if they know any, a good referral would be um, anyone that you know that sends their children to a childcare centre because then you could contact that person and say, would you mind, you know, speaking for me or can I, can you give me an introduction to the childcare centre that you go to? 
Um, and I think they're more likely to, the BNI members are more likely to know someone that sends their ch children to mm -hmm. a childcare centre than they would know necessarily, possibly yeah. than they'd know actual childcare centres. But mm -hmm. if you might better come in via the back door by asking, you know, I mean, try it. A lot of things is, is trial and error and, and see what sticks, really. Um, but also, I think it's important when you're starting out not to overthink it as well. So uh, mm -hmm. it's a, I think it's a, it's a good model to niche, particularly in this day and age with the amount of apps that are available. And if you become a childcare centre specialist, your marketing, your message on your website will be all about that will be all about the apps they need. You're the expert. You, you come in and just streamline the whole thing. Um, but when you're starting out, it doesn't mean that you say no to other referrals. And I think also when they, they, you can get stuck on, on niching in childcare centres and what you want to do is say, yes, I would like to niche in childcare centres and that might stick but I don't really know yet because I haven't really tested it out. And maybe you, you may or may not have a childcare centre right at the moment. Um, so just put referrals, get them to whatever referral, a good referral for me. I, I would also often say is someone that is proactive about their finances, who wants to be empowered around their finances. So I didn't actually care what industry it is. Uh, I was just interested in someone that wanted to be empowered around their finances, that wanted more than just data entry and compliance. I can do all these things, but I'm interested in clients that really want to take responsibility um, and, for, and have a you know, financial partner uh, that can walk the walk with them. I actually, I used um, the PB template for the presentation for, at BNI last oh, yeah. week, I think it was, or the week before. That was good, really good, really very helpful. And um, yeah, it went down well. Um, I printed it off, like gave the members a PDF copy of the presentation. Yeah, yeah, excellent. But I'm gonna prepare another one because I've now put my hand up. I wanna jump in whenever someone else can't do it, if someone's away or they hadn't got prepared, whatever, I wanna jump in and do it mm. um, because I wanna improve on what I did the first time. Yeah. I wanna put a better one out there and yeah. be more specific. Because um, a couple of people are approaching me saying, April, I'd like to hear you speak more about exactly who you want so that I can go get someone for you. Mm. Yeah, I'm trying that's to get right. specific that's info great. together for them. Yeah, yeah, that's really encouraging. If people are actually asking you. Mm. Like, yeah, they're wanting to do it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that, that's good. And case studies are really good in those presentations as well. Well, I've got mm -hmm. another licensee I speak to um, that's in BNI, and she did a case study on how she helps a, or how, how a particular client came to her in a particular industry that she wants to, you know, get more clients in, and you know how she helped that client, and now, you know, what they're what they're doing, you know, how how they're succeeding now and the success of their business. So, um, case studies really because pe people then think, oh, you know, I've got somebody in the similar situation, or you know, I, I I myself want to succeed so I need to have somebody look at it and redo it and you know get to that point so yeah. I know when I hear a case study I, that's when I understand what people do it's like yeah. oh now I know what you do yeah, yeah. it connects more so yeah, yeah. Mm. awesome very thank good you, thank you a lot of notes <laughs> awesome <laughs> Does anybody else want to jump off mute and talk about their business model and, and particularly if they've got any challenges or any, you know, success stories? Maybe they've got a case study themselves of how they've dealt with moving from overwhelm and, you know, don't know where to start and, and now are really clear on what their case study is, their um, business model is. Attending all of these helps. Oh, sorry, Helen, you can go. Mm -hmm. Attending all of these gives us an overall vision of what we really want. And, you know, like, oh, yeah, we love to have a business that I could sell. We'd love to have a lifestyle business. But I really didn't know. I sort of stumbled into the business. 
and through pure ball keeping systems, I'm getting more of an idea. And I kind of want a lifestyle business like Robin has, but I also want one like April that I want to keep working on until, um, until I can't work anymore. Mm -hmm. And I want to be able to travel what, mid next year, I think they say. Mm -hmm. um, so like with pure bookkeeping systems, it allow me to, to plan for all of that. And I had to talk to Sharon and I actually have to do a proper business plan. So it's going to make me really think about it. And it's time to, you know, practice what I preach, tell, mm -hmm. tell clients that they've got to do all this. I now have to do it myself. But yeah. all the all the assistance that we've been getting, it helps us know where to go next mm -hmm. and not and I've been, I think, so scared of spending too much time on the business that I spend none. Mm -hmm. Because I've seen people do that with different businesses, that they um, you know, they've got to have the filing cabinets, they've got to have the computer, they've got to have everything completely right, but they've got no business. Mm. So I think that sort of frightened me a bit that I, no, I've just got to work in the business. I've just got to do all these things to, to, for the business. Yeah, it's, having, it's having that balance, isn't it? Of you've got to work in yeah. the business to get to bring the income in and have a business that's running. But you've also got to spend that time in planning it out and not not running up the ladder on the wrong up against the wrong tree, yeah. Because you want to you know make sure that you're climbing that ladder that's going to lead you to the right business that you're trying to build. So there's certainly some leadership and and um, planning mm -hmm. out. And a business plan is a great place to start. Um, and I know Sharon's yeah. going to have a template for you to work through. Really. <laughs> <laughs> it become I'm sure she does I think she's listening she to this. <laughs> um, yeah. I'll get her to send you one so it will just help you um, you know articulate the different stages of your business of you know what you want for it and if it's a, it sounds like a lifestyle business which is going to take you to you know till the end of your working life um, yeah. and which which is, you know, similar to what Robin is envisaging right now. I mean, it can change in two years' time. Yeah. It, you know, it's always evolving. That's something that I'm really, that I am careful about. Um, it sounds like it's actually, you know, I'm arguing against myself with it. But um, I'm very clear on what I want. But I also like options. Like, so I do have, you know, all the processes in place. Um, and client manuals and things like that so that if I suddenly decided I wanted to add you know um, a bookkeeper or I wanted to grow then I do um, I take advantage of everything that I can um, and run my business as a business um, so that I yeah I've got that opportunity if I do change my mind and I want to do something a little bit different I can do that and and that's that's a really important thing um, I, I've seen it over and over again uh, that, uh, well, I mean, I experienced it. I did it in my business where I just, I had no intention of putting on staff. I just, when I started my business, I said to all my clients, hi, I'm Debbie, I'm your bookkeeper here. Let's go get going. And we got started. And then uh, 12 months later, I was full up and started working with Peter Cook and realised, you know, the, the strategy to put on staff and what have you. And I hadn't written any systems. There was no client's bookkeeping manual because I didn't go in intending to do that. And I made that mistake. So anyone that's watching or listening or watching the recording, um, if you are on your own, like Robin is, and at this point in her life is quite happy to be on her own, but things might change. Do yourself a favour and put all the systems in place as if you were had already made the the decision to put on staff in 12 months time. So you've got the client's bookkeeping manual, you've got the BAS preparation checklist, you've got your workflow management all, all going on so that, and then in 12 months time or two years time or three years time, it won't matter. It's no, you know, it's no big deal, but it is a big deal 
if in 12 months time you go, I didn't think I'd grow this fast. This is crazy. Um, I don't want to turn away clients, which is what I was saying. Um, okay, I'll recruit. And then you're already up to here. You're putting on a recruit and you've got to document your systems. So do yourself a favor and put the systems in place right at the start as early as you can. Do it now. If you, if, even if you've been in business for years, start documenting your systems with the intention of having that available to hand over to another bookkeeper. Now, if you never do that, then that won't, it's no time wasted or anything like that because having the systems means you can get stuff out of your head. You don't have to think, no, did I remember to do so-and-so? And, or you wake up at 3 a.m. thinking, oh, my goodness, I did, I've forgotten to do someone's payroll or whatever. So you document your systems to make it easier for you and then that, might, that will flow in much more easily for you when you're ready to put on staff. Yeah, and if I can just jump in and say too, um, having your systems documented means um, that when you are in those times in your life when something's not going well for you, where you're unwell or you're needing to support other people, that sort of thing, that you're sort of, you can, uh, you can rely on your systems to support you. So you can actually look at your systems and go, this is what I need to do now. Now this is what I need to do. And you can work through it and, and yeah, rely on them to support you and get you through those tough times. And also, even if you don't put on staff or maybe you do put on staff, at the end of the day, you might think that you're going to be working in, like I plan to work in my business forever. Um, but like, what if, <laughs> what if when my husband retires, I suddenly go, oh, that's what I, that's what I want too. Well, I've got all the systems in place that make my, my business more valuable to sell. So mm -hmm. I, I've just got more, op, you know, more options available to me. Mm. Yeah, I, I love that analogy of your systems will support you. Mm. So we don't think of it that way. We, we, we create systems to, you know, support the business and organise ourselves and stuff like that. But, yeah, as you say, when your brain is not as clear for family reasons, personal reasons, that at least your systems will tell you what to do by by rote you know it's it's not having to think about you know what clients up next what work do I need to do what you know what's you know what time of the month do I even have to lodge basses you know your system is telling you everything that you you need to do which is which yeah. is good and providing all that information if it's in your head and you have a brain dead you know you're, you're having trouble focusing for, for other reasons, then, you know, your systems are telling you all that information. So it's really important. Yeah, um, it's mm. so important. I do think that as bookkeepers, we like everything perfect. And mm. I think maybe yeah, that's um, what where April's going as well, trying to get everything perfect, um, everything in place. Um, and like Debbie said, get some money coming in and sort of mm. um, pull back on that a little bit. But I do think that we kind of stick at it until we've got everything perfect and then we move on to the next thing. It, I think that's just who we are. <laughs> but it also is, is that there's just so much good stuff out there, like Mark Wickersham, like, oh, yeah, I want to jump in and do that. But you know what? I haven't got time to do that. I've got the book written by um, Ron Baker and that's great too. But there's only so many hours in the day. I can't, I have to do some work. I can't do these things. But yeah. I thought, I do in that situation and I spoke to Jacqueline about this as well um I've I've got something in my um I use Asana so workflow software whatever you use um that's called I can't think, it's like ideas and thoughts or something like that and it's basically a brain dump and whenever I see anything I grab the URL I put it in there and then some other time I come back to it but I know I'm not going to miss it I'm not going to forget about it someone says oh this is a great book I put that in there and then when I've got that time that's when I look at that you know or when I'm you know like when I've got a cold and I want to spend the day in bed that's when I you know go through get all that CPD done watch those videos you know that sort of thing and and also the other way of determining you said there's so many things apps and what and videos and webinars and things like that I think when you we were talking earlier about you know where do you actually spend your time and this is not directed 
specifically to UA polices generally, but one way of looking at where you're going to spend your time is, is look at what is that going to give you? So, uh, and is it going to, is it part of your master plan, which brings us right back to the start, which is your vision. So the Mark Wickersham and uh, value-based pricing will increase your income. There, there is no doubt about that because you're, you're doing it on a value-based pricing model. Now, that's, I would say, higher up. If there were other things that, you know, let me compare Asana with carbon and all your workflow choices, just pick one and go with that and don't spend too much time on that because you're on your own. You might change, but just get it done. This is what you need to do. But, but something like value-based pricing is actually going to increase your income. And so I would consider that to be a higher priority. So think whenever there's an opportunity to look at something or grow or learn, say, we all want to grow and learn. And it's all, it stretches our mind and it's all very interesting and things like that. Is that actually going to help me achieve or get, get faster, get, get, you know, get, bring the thing faster to where I want to be? Or is it just, uh, and, you know, let's put that down the list, save it for what Robin said on a day when, um, you know, a rainy day or something like that. And, and have that as your CPE. Gee, that was interesting. I learned some stuff. But these other things are the most important things I need to do. And that will help you um, discern which things, instead of being overwhelmed, you sit down and go, well, what's this going to give me? What is the outcome of this? And is it going to get me closer or faster to my end game by spending an hour or a month or a year putting this into place? And it's like even with the pure bookkeeping system, that doesn't happen overnight. Implementing that doesn't happen overnight, but it's for your long-term future for to systematize your business so that you can achieve what you want and you'll get there faster with it. Mm. And as you are going out and finding new, better clients, I wouldn't be adding them to your D clients. I'd be replacing your Ds. So mm. march those Ds out. You don't want to just get busier for the sake of it. You want to get better. Yeah. yeah. So replacing them. Mm. Now, we are almost out of time, but Helen, you did have your hand up. Is there something that you did want to contribute today? In the and last couple of minutes? Okay. I just thought if you wanted someone to talk, I can talk. <laughs> <laughs> I will just quickly say um, on the the niching client thing and well, your ideal client, as I have been doing this 20 years, I look at it, I've been running the business now um, seriously for two years and I just realised who my ideal client is three days ago. No. So, <laughs> yeah, I used to think about it because you have some clients that maybe their income was a D but they're great in all the other aspects and all as far as industries I love a mixture of industries because I learn also from that I don't want to just be one industry because if we you know if I'm just going to do dance studios and we have another COVID break and whichever you know there goes my business so I never liked the idea of niching in a certain industry but I there is um you know the type of person and it's the type of income and it is, you know, their mindset, their goals. Um, yeah, so it's, I think it's just things that sometimes come to you. I don't know. So I won't mm. get rid of my other clients because they're ideal. I got rid of all my D clients, but I know my new clients will will be the ones that I will target around that ideal. Mm. And I think, well, you know, the others that aren't, don't fit the model of the ideal, I won't personally be working with them. But, you know, they're still a good added bonus for our business. They're lovely to deal with. I've had them for 15 years plus. So they won't be discarded or mm. passed on, but they just won't take up my time as much anymore. You know, the odd phone call to say hi, but I won't personally be working on their business. So awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for contributing. And um, I'm sorry we've run out of time for, you know, bigger conversations. I think we've, We've had a great uh, engaging conversation and a great example to be able to work work our way through. So it's it's awesome when we have 
um, audience that can give us um, uh, some content to, to work with and, you know, to answer and, and work through and brainstorm. Uh, we love that type of engagement on these calls. So I really appreciate that. So thank you, April, for, for being so, so candid with, with that and the other contributors as well. Now I have put up the Bookkeeping Business Blueprint um, link in the comments. So we did mention it at the start, so we won't go through it now, but it is the black, the, the belts um, of where a expectations are around um, turnover and staffing and, and hours and your commitment to your business as well at all the different stages of a business. So that is in the Facebook group um, to jump over there and grab the link to that as well. Um, but other than that, I think we'll, we've just passed the hour. So thank you so much, everyone, for contributing, for attending. And for those on Facebook, we had some comments over there as well. Um, and thanks, Deb and Robin, for helping out. Lovely to chat with you. And we will see you all next week. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>